Welcome to the March meeting of the Surrey Arrhythmia Support Group. Um, for those who haven't been before, my name is Jane Race and I'm the Chair and Public Lead of Surrey ASG. I'd also like to introduce our patient lead, Rosemary Najin, and our clinical lead, Dr. Richard Bogle. Um, Dr. Bogle is a consultant cardiologist and clinical lead for cardiology at Hepsom St. Helier Hospital. Our speaker this month is Sue Jones, um, who is the Pacing and ICD Service Manager Cardiology at St George's Healthcare Trust, and she will be speaking to us about pacemakers. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it's very, very quickly. Um, uh, for the benefit of those who are unable to attend today, we will be videoing um, this uh, meeting, um, and questions will be at the end. Um, due to time constraints, can we limit it to just one um, question per person? And if you can just raise your hand at the end, and Sue will answer your questions. Thank you very much. So I, just, I was just going to thank Sue very much for coming and just say to you, obviously, a lot of people in the room are interested in atrial fibrillation. This is going to be a slight sideways look at that because Sue's going to talk about pacemakers. Just before um, you came, I was thinking about this and saying to myself, how many times patients have said, even though they've had atrial fibrillation, oh, would a pacemaker benefit for me? They might have talked to a friend and thought it would. So Sue's going to... Been, doing pacing longer than, I think, virtually anyone else in this country. <laughs> what Sue doesn't know about pacemakers isn't worth knowing. She is absolutely like the guru of pacing. So you're really fortunate. We are fortunate to have you here. <laughs> and thank you very much for coming. And we look forward to your, your talk. Thank you for that introduction, <laughs> Richard. It's a pleasure to be here, actually. Um, I, I like talking about devices in particular. It is my specialty. I've been doing it a long time. It's a very exciting specialty to work in because it's one of the areas we can we can really actually help patients. And what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is not an awful lot of technology because that can be very boring, but it's really how technology has advanced to allow us to treat more options, therefore give us you know sort of more conditions that we can now do things about. We may not be able to cure them, but we can actually alleviate them or help them or you know. Sort of ameliorate them a little bit. Uh, whereas before, a pacemaker was a simple cost. You put it in, it lasted six months if you were lucky, and you couldn't do anything except paste so much weeks a minute. But now we can do all sorts of clever things. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about this as, as I go along. What I wanted to sort of, I, I've called it implantable devices for cardiac rhythm management. Because they're not just pacemakers <coughs> now. We have a, a range of devices that are available to treat different conditions, cardiac rhythm conditions, and also to diagnose cardiac rhythm conditions as well. And diagnosis obviously is a big, big part of deciding what we do with you if you have an arrhythmia. Is it a slow arrhythmia? Is it a fast arrhythmia? Can we do something useful with the device to help it? Um, it may be done in conjunction with medication. So there's all sorts of options, and I'll try and give you a little taste of some of the options and what we do with them. And then also how we look after people who have them in as well, because this is another big part of device management, is actually to be able to look after the patient that has the device implanted. So, have I got something that will advance this? No. Huh? I'll just have to press the buttons, okay. Right. Okay. Right, going through some of the devices, I've got there's three major categories of implantable device for cardiac rhythm detection or management. And the first of these is the what we call the reveal. Um, that was the only one at one time, but it's now actually expanded and there are now two or three different types. And what these are, are implantable rhythm monitoring loop reports. <coughs> so it's like having your own implanted 24 hour tape. Has any of you ever had a reveal implanted? No. Okay, well we do it quite often for patients who we cannot get an easy diagnosis of a rhythm that might be troubling them. We've put them through everything that we can think of to look at for an abnormal rhythm, like exercise testing, standard 24-hour monitors, which I'm sure a lot of you have had. Um, 
exercise tests, other sort of you know, diagnostic methods, and you can't find anything. So in some patients, we implant a little loop recorder, which is quite tiny, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second. Um, and that is a continual loop recording, and it just goes on and on, monitoring the heartbeat until the patient has a symptom, and then they use an activator, they go bang, it stops the loop, and you get a sort of 40 seconds worth of ECG, or a minute's worth of ECG, or three minutes worth of ECG, depending on how you set it up. So we then get a diagnostic ECG recording that's associated with the patient's symptoms. And these are also now, they've become really reduced in size, they're minute, they're about this big. I unfortunately didn't have a demo to bring you, but it's like a, you know, it's about a sort of half an inch long, and we can inject them. We inject them into the chest wall, and they're managed with a remote control device again, that the patient can activate it, and then we can download the information via a wireless telemetry monitor. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute on a couple of pictures, which will mean more to you. So we have the, the reveal. Um, and then there's the most one that everybody's heard of, which are pacemakers. Um, and pacemakers, uh, simple pacemakers, are typically single chamber with one lead in the heart, or the majority of them, which are two leads in the heart. And pacemakers have two leads in the heart. They're, that's a single chamber pacemaker. They're quite small. Anyone here got pacemakers? Two? They're quite tiny, they don't hopefully give you a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and if they're a single lead, they may be in the bottom of the heart normally, but that's not very physiological because we want the heart with a pacemaker to beat in sequence from the top to the bottom, which is what it does naturally. Um, so most of the pacemakers we put in, about 80%, are dual chambers, so they have a lead in the top of the heart and a lead in the bottom of the heart. And they're the same size as this, they've just got two leads coming out of them. <coughs> so, about um, the pacemaker implant rate in the UK is, I think at the moment, standing at about 500 per million. It's quite a high rate of implant. It's sort of worked its way up from the, most, the lowest in Europe to about sort of normal now. I'll show you a graph later of the implant rates for certain devices. Um, so, pacemakers are relatively I would say common procedure, but quite a large number of patients have them. And at George's, we, we implant about um, 500 pacemakers a year. So it's quite a big number. And what a pacemaker actually does is it actually keeps the heart regulated. So a pacemaker is there to predominantly regulate slow heart rhythm. Pacemakers are usually used when the patient has either a slowing down of the heart rate from the top chamber or has some form of blocking mechanism between the top and the bottom of the heart. <coughs> um, so the pacemaker delivers pulses to the heart, either to the top and the bottom or both, to keep the heart beating in a nice, stable, controlled way. And then the third category of devices are implantable cardiac defibrillators. Have you heard of those? Anybody here got one? Mm. Yeah? Okay, hello. <laughs> um, and the implantable cardiac defibrillator, there's a variety of reasons for having these, but they're always associated with patients who have a high risk of a life-threatening cardiac rhythm. And that is normally patients who've either had a cardiac arrest or are at risk of having a cardiac arrest. Um, or have had a life-threatening fast ventricular, what we call tachycardia, and that's what we call BT. Um, if you have AF, which I know a lot of you do have and are interested in, we don't consider, although AF is uncomfortable and very is abnormal and not very pleasant, it does not warrant having an ICD implanted because it's not considered to be a life-threatening, dangerously heart school. Um, and what an ICD does in the presence of a fast, dangerous heart rhythm is either deliver pacing to the heart at a very fast rate, unlike the normal standard pacemakers, which deliver the slow rates, 
these are treating fast heart rate, so they're very different, or what it can do is deliver a shock to the heart, an electric shock, which jolts the heart, and like you've seen on casualty or DR or whichever medical program you watch, when they apply the paddles to the outside of the chest, it jerks the heart back into, electrically stuns the heart back into its normal rhythm. And some of you, if you've got atrial fibrillation, may have had cardioversion. And this is what, like, is exactly like cardioversion, but it does it from inside the heart itself. The wire in the heart delivers the shock to the heart. And that's just showing you some pictures. I thought you might like to see some pictures of bearing devices, and I've got a few here that you can have a look at. Um, that's a reveal in, that is implanted. It's quite small, it's about, well, I hate to say this is the size of a sort of old cigarette lighter. <laughs> um, about an inch and a half long, quite thin. And it's implanted just under the skin. And the patient has an activator, which you can see on the left, and they and put that over the skin, press the button, that stops the loop. And then we get a recording on this special program that we can download and look at. So we've got pacemakers, that's a little bit of history here if you'd like it. 1958 the first pacemaker was implanted, um, it was pretty basic. Um, and ICDs, the first implantable one was in 1984. Uh, this little job on the right here was the first ICD or one of the first ICDs. And as you can see, technology. <laughs> Not That's changed a bit. So <laughs> it's applying to the ridiculous. Um, this is actually a current ICD, and there is a bit of a difference in the size. And the first ones were implanted in the abdomen with patches that were attached to the heart on the outside of the heart, and they were quite basic devices. And just a little bit of history for you, because it might amuse you. The first pacemaker was entirely handmade. It had some very basic batteries in it. They lasted about six months, if you were lucky. Um, I hasten to say I wasn't around when the first pacemaker. <laughs> um, it had a terribly basic electronic circuit, which was all handmade. It was soldered together in a work on a workbench. Um, I've got pictures of that which I won't show you, but it was actually made in somebody's shed in their backyard in the first ones. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, it was encapsulated in a resin, as you can see. It's a, a clear epoxy resin, uh, about 55 millimeters and 16 millimeters. And it's a, it was about, this is an early pacemaker. It was about this size. And under here is a sort of resin capsule, but uh, I can't place that open. Um, and they used a Kiwi shoe polish can as the mold. <laughs> <laughs> it was American. Um, so I just thought you might be interested to see that. Um, this just shows you a mishmash of ICDs and evolving progress in device technology. And, you know, the first devices could only do very basic things. They, they couldn't do very much at all. As I said, they could only deliver a pacing pulse to the heart. Or the first ICDs could only deliver a shock and couldn't differentiate between different types of rhythm didn't have any of the sort of management facilities that all our devices now have, um, and were very, very basic. So we've actually moved on a pace from the first devices, and in you know, this year alone we've seen new developments, and every year we see more and more bells and whistles added to devices, which give us more capabilities, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in a minute. Um, okay. And that just shows you the ICD or defibrillator in evolution from the early days to not that long ago. You can see the spread of decreasing in size as technology improves. <coughs> now, I just wanted to quickly talk a little bit about why we put pacemakers in. Um, they are, as I said just now, always for, nearly always for slow rhythms. Um, and there are a variety of all clever names that I won't go into for, in detail for you because you, you know, that would take too long. Um, but they're varying types of either an abnormal slowing of the heart due to either an electrical conduction glitch in the heart. Um, all arrhythmias are usually caused by an electrical 
interruption or an electrical triggering is in atrial fibrillation of abnormal bits of the heart. And you know the heart's made up of the plumbing and the electrics, but it's the electrics we're talking about here, and that's what it causes arrhythmias. So electrical hitches cause arrhythmias, either slow ones or fast ones. If they're slow, we call them bradycardias. If they're fast, we call them tachycardias or tachycardias. Um, and there are varying levels throughout the heart which conduct the electrical impulses. And you've probably had some talks on those at some stage. Um, and bits of these heart conductor bits can get blocked, and that causes slowing of the heartbeat because it needs to go through the normal circuit in order to beat normally. And if you get interruptions and glitches, then it slows the sort of signals down and the heart doesn't pump as efficiently and beat as normally as it should. There are various things that can cause that. Um, but most of them, if they are causing symptoms of dizziness or blackouts, some people present with blackouts, um, then they become symptomatic to the slow heart rhythm and need a pacemaker. And the pacemaker is, is the answer in most cases of brady arrhythmia that are caused by electrical glitches. And that just shows you a sudden pause in the heart. This is the ECG. You can see it beginning, you've got two beats in order, and then there's this great long pause, and this is someone's heartbeat just going suddenly, deciding to slow down. And that could give them significant dizziness, or even if it stays slow enough for long enough, they can black out, become single. And this is a different type of pause. It, this is pause from sinus arrest. This is stands, ventricular standstill or heart block. And what we can see here is this is the normal QRS that the heart produces when it's stimulated electrically normally. And it normally follows a P wave, which are these, They're the atrial conduction. And when the atrial contraction occurs and doesn't produce one of those, then, then the ventricle signal is blocked and nothing is coming through into the pumping chamber so the heart doesn't beat. So it goes into what we call asystole, becomes ventricular standstill, and that's where people have syncopal attacks or blackouts. <coughs> and so it's ventricular standstill. Um, with advanced technology, we have some advances in, as I said earlier, the, treat, the kind of conditions we can treat with pacemakers. And these are some of them. Heart failure has become a very, very, very big option for treatment with pacing. And um, have any of you heard of treatment for heart failure with pacemakers? I hope it doesn't sort of worry you or scare you too much or sort of bore you too much. But what we can actually now do is with people who have what's called heart failure, it always sounds worse than it is heart failure. It merely means that the pump, the LV, and the right angel, the ventricular muscle, doesn't work as efficiently as it should do. And this can be for all sorts of reasons. It can be enlarged, it can be as a result of ischemic heart disease and it's deprivation of blood to the ventricle, ventricular muscle, and that can cause poor function. Um, but either way, if the function of the heart deteriorates and is no longer pumping effectively to, enough to cause heart failure, then it may, under certain circumstances, not everybody with heart failure can be helped, I have to stress that, but a, quite a large proportion of people may be helped with what's called heart failure pacing, and that's called CRT, and it stands for Cardiac Resynchronization Therapy. And what we're doing with pacing in this case is putting in leads to different sides of the heart, this is a side view of an x-ray. I should have done a better one than this, actually, but it was all I could get at the last minute. Um, and here, in most pacemakers, you just have two wires. But this one has three wires. And there's one here towards the front of the heart. There's one here to the back of the heart and one here in the bottom of the heart. These two wires here are, in the ru are effectively stimulating both sides of the heart muscle, <coughs> the right and the left side. And when you have heart failure or pump failure, the two sides of the heart tend to do this. So you don't get nice synchronous pacing uh, output. 
and that means the blood amount of blood that the ventricles can pump reduces. So you get a drop in cardiac output. Okay. But this brings it all back together again, paces both sides of the heart, and in fact, in a lot of patients, they get a very, very good response and feel almost back to normal. They may still have some signs and symptoms of heart failure, but they will feel the benefit of this. And it may you know, save them from being admitted to hospital, because often with heart failure you have to be admitted quite a lot. And this actually does save them from hospital admissions and makes them feel a lot better. And we get a very, very good response. <coughs> <laughs> Just going back to the indications of pacing. So biventricular pacing, which is resynchronization. And then there are some fairly rare reasons for pacing in sort of patients who might have inherited conditions. And long QT syndrome is one where, again, it's the electrics of the heart are abnormal. And in these patients, and they're usually very young patients, um, often children, can be children, but usually young adults and children. Um, and, and they may be diagnosed by having a 12 lead ECG for some reason, and it's found that they have long QT syndrome. I won't go into the details because it's quite complicated, but they, they have a risk of an arrhythmia, and with some patients they benefit from a pacemaker, which helps to kind of stabilize the electrics in the heart. Cardiomyopathy, there are some patients who may benefit, but that's quite few and far between, but it is a new indication for pacing. And on the bottom I put atrial fibrillation, I was going to say this is where Richard mentioned earlier. There really is very, there are very few patients with atrial fib who will benefit from a pacemaker in terms of AF prevention. And we have a lot of patients at George's, a lot of patients in the pacing sort of spectrum who present with atrial fib, but normally pacing itself won't help it. And one of the problems that we sometimes have with patients who have AF and have, a, have to have a pacemaker because of other reasons is that they think it might help their atrial fib. Now, there are some circumstances in which it might. Uh, one of those is sometimes in AF you have what's called a Bradley Tacky syndrome where the heart goes fast and then it goes slow. And if in AF you have sudden pauses and the heart goes very slow, or if you suddenly get sudden causes just out of the blue, that can be a trigger mechanism for atrial fibrillation sometimes. And sometimes with a pacemaker, pacing the atrium to keep it stable, may stop that trigger mechanism that generates the fibrillation, the atrial fib. But it's not a very common response. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. It's fairly few and far between. So it's gradually dependent AF may benefit occasionally, but there are very, very, I can think of very few patients where atrial fibrillation can be resolved with a pacemaker. At one stage there was, a pace, there was an ICD available for atrial fib, in other words you had your own internal shopping device, um, uh, and that was tried for a while, but people couldn't tolerate having to give themselves shocks, and I think they were not surprising, mm -hmm. hardly surprising at all, because it's not very pleasant sort of situation for you, um, and that was abandoned, so it was given up. But we did try, and we actually implanted about 10 devices for this, so it was fraught with disaster from start to finish. So, although a lot of people with atrial fibrillation end up with pacemakers, it's usually because they're being given drugs to slow the atrial fibrillation, and sometimes that slows the heart so much, so slowly, that you need a pacemaker to bring <coughs> it up, so it's a sort of six and two and three situation. Um, so, you know, you, you, you need the drugs because that controls your fibrillation, but you need something to bring it back up to get back to normal, which is the pacemaker. Patients who've had an ablation for atrial fib, anyone here who's had an amy node ablation, the bit of electrics between the top and the nerve? Okay, fine. Um, there are some patients with atrial fibrillation who have what's called an amy node ablation. Pen there, I could just draw something over. No, I was going to draw something over there. No, never mind, anyway. Basically, between the top and the heart is an electrical fungal. Um, and sometimes, what, what happens when you have AF is that the signals get walk, 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 walk down to the ventricles, right? So you end up with fast palpitations. 
Um, if it gets persistent and there's no other way of stopping it, we've tried drugs, we've tried perhaps an AF ablation, which perhaps some of you might have had. You can actually electrically ablate the source of the atrial fibrillation in the atrium. Um, but if none of those work, then sometimes we resort to an AV node ablation and block this sort of little gizmo, electrical gizmo in the middle of the heart to stop it taking the signals down to the ventricles. And then you need a pacemaker because you've blocked it and it's going too slowly. So again, it's a sort of six and two threes. You stop it going through, but then you've got to bring it back up. So those are the sort of scenarios where you might use pacemakers with atrial fibrillation. Um, there's probably several others, but I won't get into the details of those because I wanted to talk to you just a bit more about general, general devices. Okay. Um, I'd just like to quickly talk to you about why we put in defibrillators. You know, they sound aggressive beasts, they shock the heart, it sounds all very sort of awful, but there are a lot of patients who present with life-threatening rhythms, arrhythmias. Um, and it's a, quite a big proportion of you know, the total number of patients who have implantable devices. Um, and we're implanting about 250 ICDs a year at St George's. So it's quite a large number. And there are, again, two types of, sort of reason for having needing an ICD. One is in patients who have been found to be at risk. They've not actually had an arrhythmia, but there are lots of quite malignant conditions, and they're all electrical conditions, mainly electrical conditions in the heart, um, which can put a patient at risk of having a life-threatening arrhythmia. And the two life-threatening arrhythmias we're talking about are ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Um, and we're seeing a lot of patients, or not a lot, but a significant number with familial inherited conditions. In other words, it's genetically inherited, passed down through the family. And you may hear of families who have a history of what we call sudden cardiac death. And sudden cardiac death is when they have a sudden blackout and it's due to a life-threatening arrhythmia. And you heard about, what was his name? The priest member. The priest member. That's right, it's Hagner Plegetten. He collapsed on the football field. He went into VF. It was found that he had a familial condition. Um, and I'm not giving away any confidences because he talks about it and it's all in the public domain. Um, but he has a familial condition. Um, he's a hokum. And he's at risk of sudden cardiac death. He's already had one. So he's actually a secondary prevention because he's already had a cardiac condition. And there's all sorts of screening going on now in schools, in sports clubs, and um, I don't know whether anyone's heard of Pride, Highly At Risk in the Young. Mm. It's a really, really good charitable organisation who do a lot of work, and the Cardiomyopathy Association as well. Um, they do a lot of work with young people and they screen people. You know, we, we actually do quite a lot of their screenings at George's um, and bring people in at the weekends, school children, <coughs> young people, and, and screen them for any abnormalities of the electric. ECG basically, so we're looking for electrical abnormalities of the heartbeat. <coughs> and it's surprising how many different conditions there are, and they're all down to sort of different genetic sort of um, abnormalities. And we can identify an enormous number of the genes, and we're beginning to identify more and more of these genes. And, you know, perhaps in time to come, I don't think it'll be in my time, but in time to come, we'll be able to perhaps, you know, treat it more effectively than just treating a possible problem when it happens, or cure it, by you know, gene, genetic manipulation, whatever, um, however you feel about that. But the familial inherited conditions are there. We see a lot because we have two familial inherited clinics at George's for this type of patient. So we do get a lot of these patients. Um, and we have quite a young cohort of patients with ICDs, as well as a, an older group as well. Um, so those are the sort of familial inherited conditions that we look at. There's cardiomyopathies, which are abnormalities of the heart muscle, which give rise to risk of electrical malfunction, VF and VT. Um, things called Brugada syndrome, non QT, I've already mentioned. Different types of cardiomyopathy, there are several different types. Um, and so that's you know, quite a large group. There's also another group of patients who uh, have ICDs primary prevention, they may never have had an abnormality of the rhythm or a life-threatening one. 
And these are patients who've had a heart attack, the plumbing type blockage or myocardial infarction. And patients who've had myocardial infarctions and who have poor pump failure or pump function may also be given an ICD because from studies that have been done, and there's massive studies that have been done throughout the UK, Europe, America, the world, that show that patients of this type with poor LV function and they've had ischemic heart disease may be at higher risk of having an arrhythmia than other patients. And we offer these patients a defibrillator um, to protect them. It won't do anything else, it will just protect them if they get an arrhythmia. Related to deliver therapy and get them out of it. So those are the major primary groups. And then the secondary groups are patients who have presented with an abnormal life threatening. You hear of patients having a cardiac arrest, they're resuscitated, they're brought in, and those patients would normally be getting an ICD. Um, also, patients present with what we call ventricular tachycardia, which may not be life threatening <coughs> like a VF arrest, but it's certainly unpleasant and it doesn't, it gives them problems and it puts them at very high risk of going on to have a cardiac arrest. So, patients with ventricular tachycardia that can't be ablated or is not suitable for anti arrhythmic drugs would be getting an ICD. Um, and there's a couple of other groups, and I won't, I won't go into the, the details of this, it's probably too much. But as you can see, there are two kinds of patients that we, we put defibrillators in. Just an example of the tachycardias that we see, ventricular tachycardias. You can see this is more like ventricular fib, it's clutter. Very, very fast. That would bring down the heart, uh, the blood pressure, to a sort of very low level. The patient would probably feel dizzy may lose consciousness. Um, this is a slower VT, but it's an abnormal sort of broad complex, unlike the sort of normal ECG that you'd see, which is narrow. Um, and that might not be life-threatening, but it's unpleasant and it reduces the heart function because the heart's not beating normally in this room. <coughs> um, and, and this is someone with the sort of really horrid, and here's the difference in contrast. You can see from the, the first couple of beats are sort of normal and slow, and then you get a couple of ectopic beats, extra beats, and then the heart goes rat rattling into this horrible, fast ventricular rhythm, which is ventricular. Um, this just shows you the UK implant rate for devices, just to break things up a little bit. I thought it might be of interest to you. And you can see how the sort of numbers have escalated over the years. The UK actually is still behind a lot of European countries. We're way behind the States. We're at about half the level of implant in the United States. Um, if anyone likes to give the moment's thought, we're the NHS, aren't we? So it's, uh, we under-prescribe, I suspect, although I suspect also that the States over-prescribe. You can think I've had a dizzy spell in the States and you'll get an ICD. <laughs> I exaggerated for a bit. We did actually have a patient who came back from a holiday in the States and had had an ICD implanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we investigated him, he actually we couldn't find any abnormality. He blacked out and said that he needed an ICD. I really am not sure whether he did in the end, but uh, there was some doubt about the validity of him actually having it. So it doesn't happen in the UK, I hope. Um, but you can see the UK pacemaker implant rate, we're up to about nearly 500 per million, as I said. <coughs> and ICDs are running at about 50. That's a slightly older slide. In the last year, we're up to about um, 80 per million ICDs now. But the pacemakers are running at about 500 still. So it's quite a large number of the population. Um, but if you look at the comparative figures, in the States, the ICD implant rate is up to something like 300 and their pacing implant rates are about 800 to 1,000. Mm -hmm. So they're phenomenally <coughs> higher than we are. Um, but probably not a dissimilar, apart from the lot more overweight people in the States, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, it does happen. Um, what about after implantation? I just wanted to talk a little bit about some follow-up and how important it is to, like, it's sort of, you know, 
routine, regular maintenance of the implanted device once it's in. <coughs> um, when we put in a device, it's a commitment to that patient for life because they're going to have it for the rest of their life. So we have to have a follow-up clinic that's able to sort of look at them and check them and make sure that they're stable and that their condition is stable and they're not deteriorating or you know, that everything's fine, basically. So we have special clinics that actually only deal in devices um, and that's what my, what my job is, really. I'm the head of the department of the clinic George's which implants devices and we look after all those patients. Um, and we see about 7,000 patients a year through the clinic, all with implanted devices of their own sorts. Uh, the most important part of that is to assess the patient's well-being and how are they and you know, are they okay. But we also look at, we use devices to monitor battery status, we monitor the state of the electrical status of the leads because all these implantable devices that we use now have telemetry, and we can interrogate them, that's terrible, it isn't it, interrogation, but we can get the information out of their memories, they're all full of, packed full of software, and have a really good memory inside that stores all the information about what the heart rate's been doing since the last time we saw the patient. So we can have, you know, sort of a year's worth of data on somebody's heart rhythm, heart rate, so it's like having, as well as having a device that helps to control the heart rate, it also gives us masses of information about what's been going on in the heart. Not perfect, we don't get every single sort of you know, bit, but we get a lot of information that helps us clinically manage that patient. And one of the things that we have is that you know, people's rhythms change, people develop atrial fibrillation, it's very common in the device population. We often see patients come into the clinic and they've got new onset atrial fibrillation. Um, so we need to deal with that. We need to make sure they're anticoagulated appropriately. We need to make sure you know they're not going too fast. Are the medication okay? We're taking the right drugs for it. And then people's needs change. Um, pacemakers don't all come set at 70 beats a minute. We tailor it for what do you need. So if someone needs a faster heart rate, we can do that. If they need a slower heart rate, we can do that. And one of the other things we can do is all pacemakers have inside them a little sensor that measures activity. It's a little crystal. And it, as you move up and down, the crystal vibrates. That determines the amount of body activity. So we can adjust that, tune it in, and say to that pacemaker, right, you will now, every time you see activity, you'll go up from 70 to 100. And if the patient can't put their own heart rate up, because a lot of people can't, because there are drugs that bring it down, so it's again six and two three situation. We can do it with the pacemaker, and that's called rate responsive pacing. So we've got all sorts of methods of changing to suit the patient's needs. So if someone who has previously had a perfectly good heart rate response suddenly develops a block, an additional block, then the pacemaker compensates for it with a little change in the program. Um, and part of the clinic monitoring as well is also we use remote patient monitoring too. And nearly all the devices that we implant now have a home monitor. Um, my next one shows you. Yes, there we go. <coughs> so they have a little device that sits by the bedside. Um, and, or wherever in the home. Most of them now run on a mobile phone network. So it doesn't have to be plugged into the phone line, but some of the older ones have to be plugged into a telephone line, a TT landline, whatever. And at regular intervals, you can either do a download, and it downloads via the telephone line into a central server, uh, via the normal network, mobile network or the landline network. That goes to a website. We can then access the website and pick up any information that's on stored in the pacemaker or ICD or monitor, whatever it is. <coughs> and that's really, really useful. And that can happen at any time, it's automatic, um, and a lot of patients are just on an automatic schedule. We can set it up to say, right, download at two in the morning, so you never know anything about it, it does it automatically, and then if there's any problems, we get in touch with the patient and say, okay, 
better come back or everything's clear. So it's, it's really advanced technology. And again, to the benefit of the patient, it also says you need to come to the clinic. Because otherwise, you'd have to come to the clinic and we'd have to actually download it with our programmer, special little programmer. Um, that's the sort of information we get out, patient name, different devices, how many problems have they had, and these are for ICD patients. They've had some ventricular attacks and ventricular fibrillations. But this is the sort of information. Then we can go into each one of those and blow it up and get the exact details because it's all stored in there. <coughs> some of the issues that we have with patients and having a device, and I think this is an important part of it, um, are just having a device. I think it's, it's a sort of alien thing to a lot of people. Um, and sometimes takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, it's, you know, having a procedure and a device implanted and then perhaps relying on that device is, is a lot to take on board, I think. Um, pacemakers are probably not as traumatic as having a defib, because having a defib, you've been through a life threatening or life changing, often arrhythmia that's been quite traumatic, and to have an ICD implanted is a little bit more of a sort of trauma, I think, a lot more of a trauma and a life changing sort of procedure than, than a pacemaker. But equally so, a pacemaker is still an invasive procedure. So it's having it and learning to live with it and, and coping with it. Um, one of the things people do worry about is failure. You know, will, will it fail? Will it always be okay? And that's why we have clinics to reassure people that it's fine. The battery's still fine. We have very sort of clear cutoff points when batteries come down. Battery technology is now so good that most devices last about, pacemakers tend to last longer than defibs because they um, don't have to do as much from the shock point of view. They deliver shocks, they need to deliver little pulses. Um, so pacemakers tend to last about 10 to 12 years and defibs last about seven to 10, possibly six to eight. Types of device. Um, so anxieties about failing devices is, is quite high and people do worry about it, um, particularly if they kind of depend on that pacemaker because their heart rhythm is so slow underneath that if it failed they would be quite unwell. Um, life issues are things that we talk about sometimes and that's really about learning to live, it's like learning to live with any arrhythmia learning to live with a device, and you may have an arrhythmia, as, well, you probably have got an arrhythmia, otherwise you wouldn't have a device. But the, you know, the pair hand in hand is an additional worry, and it's adapting to this and coping with that, and, and that's a very important part of, of what we look for when, when we're dealing with patients who've got devices implanted. They're comfortable with it and have adjusted to it. Driving is an issue. Um, I think with arrhythmias in general, it's always an issue because it can Calls what the DVLA calls incapacity. If you have any form of incapacity, you can't drive. So there are certain conditions with devices that constitute a driving ban or a temporary ban. Um, pacemakers, it's much milder than with defib, but with defibs, the driving rules are much stricter. Um, and there's a sort of six month ban for anyone who's had a cardiac arrest or arrhythmia. With pacemakers, it's usually only a week ban and then they can get that to driving afterwards. Um, the other thing, these devices that we implant are electrical. They work by sensing the electrical signals of the heart. They're relying on those electrical signals coming in to put an output back to the heart to regulate it. So they're interacting with your own heart rhythm in order to produce a stable and regular rhythm. Of course, if they're seeing electrical signals from the heart, because the heart produces a little bit of electricity every time the muscle contracts, there's an electrical signal that you can actually measure as an electrical signal. And of course, one of the things that is measuring electrical signals from the heart, you've got to be very careful that it doesn't measure electrical signals from elsewhere. And mm -hmm. um, device patients, patients with implanted devices, worry about can it be interfered with by a computer, my Wi-Fi, whatever, my mobile phone, and you hear horror stories all over the place about if you're a pacemaker, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that, you can't use this, you can't use that. In fact, they're quite well protected. The manufacturers make them with a very clever interference protection. 
but there are certain electrical signals that can interact regardless because they look like heart signals. And the device can't tell the difference between those. They, they can only tell the difference between high frequency noise, which is very clearly electrical. Um, but in fact, if, if we look at what most people do on a day-to-day -day basis, none of us come across very much that's going to electrically interfere with a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And we always talk to patients about this and tell them what they can and cannot do. And the most aggressive form of um, got on to admit it, of interference is actually the hospital environment. So if you've got, of course. So if you've got a pacemaker or a defib in, when you go for hospital treatment, you need to tell whoever you're going to have treatment from if there's any electricity involved, just to make sure that it's okay to use it. And things like physio departments, um, if you're going to surgery, the surgeons will use um, cautionary diathermy. And depending on where you're having the diathermy, it can interfere with the pacemaker, if it's up around the pacemaker or ICD area. Um, so we have sort of guidelines for patients having surgery in hospital and what to do with their device to make it safe during surgery, if the surgery is anywhere near the basement of the device. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems with ICDs in particular is here <coughs> shocks. Shocks are pleasant under any circumstance, and we do our best to avoid any patient getting shocks, but at the end of the day, because they've had a risk of life-threatening injury near them, it's there to shock their heart back to normal should they need it. So it's actually a... Um, it's not a pleasant experience when they have it though, and most people will tell you that they hate having it. But equally so, it's, it has to sometimes happen. Um, exercising, I think that's another issue that comes up when you've got arrhythmias generally, I think, sometimes. You know, how far can you exercise safely without provoking an arrhythmia sometimes? Um, and particularly, again, coming back to defibrillators, ICDs, <coughs> the fear of exercising and taking their heart rate above the level that it will shock at because we build in different levels of safety into the program that we set for each patient. And then there's what to do in emergencies as a sort of final um, issue that we could deal with, which I'll just deal with separately. Uh, one of the big issues is patient support. I feel that you're all here and you're looking to support for your arrhythmia group. And we have the same thing with device groups as well. Um, and I have an ICD support group, uh, which we meet once or twice a year, and have a meeting and sort of discussion. And uh, we have an all day meeting usually and have several topics and uh, get people to talk to each other and then have a sort of breakout session. But it is so important to have support, I think, because cardiac arrhythmias is one area and devices our areas that there's a lot of unknowns I think and you know we don't know where we're going we don't know how we're going to end up there's things that we would like to ask questions to, to talk about and I think the experience as well and we're living in a normal sort of day-to-day -day environment a lot of people don't understand the experience you're going through um, whether it's atrial fib and arrhythmia sort of a defib or pacemaker it's often really helpful to be able to talk to someone who also has the same condition so I think support is so important. And support isn't just groups, it's actually providing all the information that, that patient needs. You know, with the device implanted, they need to know what they can and can't do, what will cause interference, when can they fly. Um, so we provide all sorts of documentation and advice for both the patient and their family. We get families involved wherever necessary and wherever it's appropriate. They need to have sort of Every patient who has a device carries an ID card, um, which gives quite clearly what it is and what to do if there's a problem. Um, they have emergency instructions about what to do if they have to call the paramedics, so the paramedics know what they've got and what to do as well. Um, some patients wear a medic alert, you know, one of the uh, sort of ID tag things, which are really good. We recommend it for a lot of our patients what to do if you get a problem with, and I say wound care, it doesn't really apply to you, you haven't got devices, but with devices, you've got a cut over a wound where it's been implanted, and sometimes we have problems with it breaking down or eroding or getting infected. 
So we need to be sure that they know what to do if there's any problems. Don't go to the GP. They won't have a clue what to do if you come straight back to us. <laughs> Ring the clinic. <laughs> Sorry, GPs. Um, and as I said, contact with other patients and support groups is, is really important. We're always putting people in touch with other patients and whatever we can to make people sort of feel more comfortable about their, their condition, really. Um, just additional stuff. Driving information is important. What the therapy feels like, what we actually go through with patients, what it will feel like if they have a shock, because that's really important. And what to do if they feel unwell, because that's sometimes a bit of a mystery. If you're not well, what do you do? Do you come to us or do you go to A&E? Do you go to the GP? Do you go to the walking centre? So we really need to be clear of what type of unwell it is and who they need to contact, depending on what the, the unwell is. Um, okay. That was just a list of what doesn't cause problems um, for patients with devices. Household electrics, mobile phones don't, Wi-Fi doesn't, computers don't, electric drills don't, TV, radio don't, microphones don't. And yet you read in books and things like that that these are the things that often do cause a problem. Um, you know, use your mobile phone on the left. Don't ever use it on the left. Sorry, on the right, if your pacemaker's on the left. That's nonsense. We've done lots of tests on patients with mobile phones and their device on the left, and we don't get any interference, basically. You've got to be sitting in the microwave oven before you get it. <laughs> um, these are the problems that we look at in the hospital environment, diagnostic radiation is fine, x-ray is fine, fluoroscopy, normal fluoroscopy is fine, mammograms are fine, computer CT scans are fine, and ultrasounds, these are all fine. Problems are MRI scans, which they cannot have, there's certain types of physio that you can't have, like TNS, transcutaneous nerve stimulation, which is used for pain control sometimes. Um, and there are a few other areas in the hospital which does cause, cause problems. Diathermy, as I've already said. Um, I won't go into this. Oh, actually, no, I will mention it because I think it's quite inter it's just interest of interest. What can happen if a patient is subjected to disease is that it can interfere with the basic function of the device. If it's a pacemaker, it can switch the device off for the time that the interference is there, which is not very nice, obviously, if someone has got virtually no underlying rhythm or a very slow heart rhythm. Um, so if it does set, see signals that are similar to the heart signals, then it inhibits the pacemaker, because the pacemaker works on demand, and if it sees the signal, it switches itself off just for that period. Um, there is a special circuit in the pacing, though, and in ICDs, where if it senses noise and sees it at a high level, it switches to a fixed mode, so it can't inhibit, and which means it's safe for the patient. It means they get pacing outputs, um, but it's not sensing their own heart rhythm. So it's a kind of six and two, three situation. And with ICDs, you can have the same as with a pacemaker, because an ICD has a pacemaker in it as well as the shocking circuit. So it can both inhibit the pacing, if the patient's using it, switch it to fixed, or it can, because the noise is in the sort of cardiac spectrum, it can sense it inappropriately and deliver a shock inappropriately sometimes. And as I've said, shocks are not pleasant, and the last thing we want to do is deliver inappropriate shocks. But if there is noise, that's what will happen. And it can also stop it delivering appropriate tachytherapy, which is the very fast pacing, if it sees noise. So as I said, these are sort of worst case scenarios there with anyone with a device. We don't harp too much on about this. It's really just with information. <clears throat> because most devices are pretty safe. And we see these sort of things happening very, very rarely. <coughs> um, I think we'll just skip this because I'd like to just talk to you about just quickly. Um, just some of the emergency ICD patient problems, which is really relevant to patients with defect more than anything else. Um, but it does happen, and sometimes pe people have arrhythmias that won't be controlled. And you may have some patients here who've got sort of have had belt bouts of uncontrolled AF or an arrhythmia that's presented with 
you know, sort of abnormal, sort of repetition, basically, and persistent arrhythmia. And sometimes in these patients, in the ICD patients, they're getting multiple episodes of this rhythmic problem. And therefore, the device keeps treating them, and that can cause them to be extremely uncomfortable. And it needs to be controlled quickly and efficiently, and they need to come to a &E. So a &E admissions is important to have patient documentation with them. Um, and not that long ago, most a &Es and most ambulance services didn't know an awful lot about devices, ICDs in particular. And there was a bit of a... Uh, people were wary of them because if you see somebody having a shock, it's not very pleasant. And they weren't sure what to do about it. But now we've had a big drive to educate sort of ambulances, a &Es, and everybody knows what to do with a patient who comes in now having shocks or having multiple arrhythmia. And they are triaged and treated very quickly and efficiently and the appropriate people are sort of brought in immediately. Um, so education is an enormously big part of follow-up, actually, of devices. We get patients admitted for other types of surgery and this, of course, as I said, interference from diathermia and cautery can cause problems. So people in the surgical areas in the hospitals need to also know how to deal with patients when they come in with devices or, in fact, if they have an arrhythmia with any arrhythmia. So if you're going into something else, they need to know about your basic condition. Um, and I think that's probably all I need to say on that. And just briefly, this is my last slide, I think, for <clears throat> just how often do we see patients with devices? And um, it's really important that we don't lose them. They need, as I said, it's a commitment for life, so that patient will need follow up at regular intervals, either with a clinic visit or by the telephone monitor link that we have, but that doesn't do everything because we can't make any changes to the devices with the telephone monitor link, it only monitors what's in the device. So pacemakers we see at three months after a first implant and then usually every year. Um, in As we get near to battery replacement, then we bring the visits forward again. Um, <coughs> defibrillators we tend to see more frequently, um, probably six monthly. And then the resig devices, these are patients who have heart failure and have an ongoing disease process with their heart failure because although we're ameliorating it with their resynchronization device, we still see the heart failure continue to go on and develop. And so they need very close monitoring. And we have what we call a, a, a sort of team approach to this with a sort of heart failure nurse, a doctor who specialises, and one of, one of my team who will look after the cardiac leucine device patients. And the sort of overall things we're looking at are technical things, most importantly, heart rhythm changes. Have they developed AF? Are we doing the appropriate treatment? Are they getting more BT than they did? Are they on the right medication? Does it need changing? So. We're looking at the whole patient, and that's what device follow-up is all about. Okay, I think that's probably as much as I can say about that. Thank you very much.